Right, this is about um, a couple of spacecraft, that, some that I'm particularly passionate about. One of them is Voyager, um, which is way, way out, and it's actually passed beyond the realm of our solar system. Uh, now, the heliopause, this giant bubble around the solar system. And the other one is uh, Rosetta, which I've talked about loads with um, all the people I know and done assemblies on it. Uh, in particular, the, the two different spacecraft are two different power methods. With Voyager, there's no way it could get enough power, so it uses a, a radioactive isotopes. And European Space Agency are, are dedicated not to use radioactive isotopes, so they had to use solar panels on the, on the Rosetta spacecraft. So really today, I'm just explaining to you how we do those calculations and how the area of solar panels can be worked out. Right, the first thing we have to think about is the power output of the sun. Now the sun uh, emits you know, a certain amount of joules every second. It's about four times 10 to the 26 watts. So um, if you just think about that for a minute, four times 10 to the 26 watts, that's four times 10 to the 26 joules in one second. It's an incredible amount of energy. And that energy is radiated out in all different directions throughout space and we're assuming uniformly. Now, when I think about this, you have to think about it like a, like a balloon. Now imagine you could capture all the energy on the inside of, of a sphere that is surrounding the sun. Now, um, somebody envisaged this and uh, they kind of researched something called the Dyson Sphere, which is encapsulating all the energy from the sun. But just think about it in terms of a, a balloon, which I've kind of got here. So, um, imagine you've got a balloon here and we just partially inflate it. Now, if the sun was at the center there and we looked at the energy that it collected all the energy on the inside of that balloon, it would be about four times 10 to the 26 watts. Now, if you blow it up, it, regardless of the size, that energy is still going to be four times 10 to the 26 watts. It doesn't matter, all you're doing is you're spreading it out over a larger area. So if we can make this balloon any size, and in fact we can stretch it to the size of the entire solar system in our minds and collect the energy from this massive sphere that encapsulates the whole of the solar system and you're still going to get four times 20, 10 to the 26 watts um, of power. That is assuming we're not getting any absorption through, you know, the, obviously the planets in the way and any gas and dust and all that kind of stuff. Right, so now we're going to link it to one of the trickiest questions that I've got in the um, AQA physics syllabus and uh, I found it's all about Voyager. Now Voyager did the grand tour of the solar system uh, way back in the 70s and 80s and it brought back some fantastic data and in fact Voyager 1 is still re recording data now and sending it back and it's all about the, the gravitational influence of the Sun. Now um, as Voyager travels through space it's got this radioisotope generator and it needs a certain amount of energy to keep it going and um, the power requirements are here and they're set out on this question. So as you can see, Voyager, Voyager needs 400 watts um, of energy, 400 joules per second, to actually work. Now, um, this is a bit old data, I think it's probably about 10 years old now, but here, for this particular question, it says Voyager is 8,000 times 10 to the 6 kilometers from the sun. Now, um, it's got, what, how big would solar panels have to be to make this work at that distance, to make it receive 400 watts? So this is where it gets a bit tricky. Now, one of the things here is what you're saying is if we've got that one meter square just like this on, on the floor, in that one meter square, like that, you're receiving 1400 watts. And that's Earth, though. Right, so with that 1400 watts, we know there that if we get our balloon and we blow it up to the size of the Earth's radius, If we could blow the balloon up to the size of the Earth's radius, what it would be is inside there we'd still be receiving the exact power amount of our power output from the sun. But we've got to use the data from this question to actually be able to calculate that. So, here, if we just imagine the sun as a point source and then we expand a light out and we say the Earth is there, and this is one astronomical unit. And we're just going to use that as approximately 1.5 times 10 to 11 meters. 
and uh, that is the radius. Now imagine we kind of went out like that and we made that into a sphere or something that resembles Pac-Man. Um, then what you can do is you're going to say that every single one of those square meters at that radius there in this sphere encompassing the whole um, the whole inner surface of the sphere here is going to receive 1,400 watts. So if we work out how many square meters we've got at that distance, then we know the power output of the sun. We can calculate it. All we have to do is add up all the 1,400s. How many 1,400s? Have we right. So to work out the area of this sphere at the radius of Earth, we need to use the equation 4 pi r squared, which is on your data sheet. Now, if we just substitute in those measurements, then you can find out uh, this surface area. Right, so as you can see, uh, that is the amount of the square meters. Now, so if we've got that many square meters, and each one of those square meters has 1400 watts, then we just times 1400 by that number, and you get the power output of the sun. So as you can see, that is the power output of the sun according to these data. So 10 to the 26 watts, what we need to do with that then, is because that is irrelevant to the size of the sphere, at the radius where Voyager is, or was at that 10 years ago, we can say that that amount of energy is spread out over that new sphere. Right, so we do the same thing again, and we use now the radius of where Voyager is to actually work out the surface area of the new right. sphere. Okay, so from calculating that then, what I found out is that is the amount of square meters we've got but we've got this amount of energy spread out over this distance. So we need to know how many watts per square meter we've got. So if we just divide the watts by the square meters, so as you can see here, um, that's the power output of the sun. I've just divided it by um, the imaginary sphere, our balloon that's blown up right the way out to where Voyager was at that particular moment in time. So that's how many square meters that balloon covers. Now, if we just divide the amount of watts we've got by the square meters we've got, what you'll get then is you get how many watts per square meter. Now, so here, you'll get this many watts uh, per square meter. Now, what we need to do there then is realize that at the start it said we needed 400 watts to actually make this uh, spacecraft work. But we're only getting 0.4921875 watts in one square meter. Right, so all we need to do then is divide the 400 by this number here. And what you get there is 812.6984127. So you write down that complete number for your exam answer, but then underneath you realize that the data you originally got given is a bit ambiguous. It could be to you know, one, two, or three significant figures here. But because of that ambiguity, I'm gonna to go to three, um, which is what you should do. If you're uncertain, just use that. And we're gonna round that up, and we're gonna say that equals 813 meters squared. Right, so just think about that for a minute. That's an insane amount of square meters. So I've just simulated outside with rulers, as you can see um, now here, this is the amount of square meters for one solar panel uh, for the Rosetta spacecraft. Now the Rosetta spacecraft panels are actually slightly bigger than this because you've got wiring and gaps in between them, but that is the actual square meterage for one and that is 32 meters squared. Now, Rosetta has two of these to, pa to power it. Even then, that's not enough to actually power the spacecraft at its distance. It had to power itself down completely and just rely on three wake-up clocks um, to actually wake it back up again. Now, um, so 813 metres squared. So it's completely unfeasible to have deep space missions without radioactive isotopes. So back to Rosetta then. It is one of the most fantastic missions. Um, I mean, I've just been in awe. And I if you've known in school, I've been talking about it all the time, I've put it into my lessons. You know, it's just so exciting. And the mission, even though Philae is down on the surface now, and I don't know whether it's going to wake back up or not, let's hope, but just think about the power we've got there uh, to actually discover something new about the solar system. Now, right now, we're kind of sniffing the comet, we're sampling it, we're waiting for the, the debris to come off as it becomes active, as it gets close to the sun. And you know, we're going to find out new things about our solar system. And, in, and because of that, we're going to find out new things about ourselves. 
Right, so now I've got some real data for you. I actually want to apply this to Rosetta. I've got some data about Rosetta's solar panels here. Now, using the ideas about that sphere and the imaginary balloon that's blowing up, it's now gone out to significantly further. So use that data, work out what energy would be received, and then see if you can calculate the efficiency of the solar panels.